Hello everyone, this is Jawad Ahmed from Medical Lectures by JD and today in this series of videos on the parasitology, today we will be covering the class Rhizopoda in which we will be mainly covering the Antamoeba Histolytica. So let's have a start. First of all, a brief overlook over the previous video. So we have divided the parasites on the basis of the regular, uh, on the basis of the cellularity into two groups. So first of all is the protozoa and the metazoa. The protozoans are the unicellular organism whereas the metazoans are the multicellular organism. Then we have divided the protozoan on the basis of their organelle of locomotion into class rhizopoda that have pseudopodia, then the class zoomestigophora that have flagella, class ciliata that have cilia, and then the class chilospora that don't have any organelle of locomotion. Similarly, on the basis, uh, we have divided the metazoa, uh, metazoans on the basis of their body shape or the body structure. So we have flatworms, the platyhelminthes and the nematohelminthes that are the round ones. So if their bodies are flat, they are placed into the platyhelminthes and if they are rounded, they are placed into the nematohelminthes. Then the platyhelminthes or the flatworms are again divided on the body basis of the body shape into class cystoda and the class trematoda. Uh, the class cyst the cystodes bodies are segmented and uh, whereas the trematodes bodies are leaf like so these are also called as flukes so that was the, the basic classification and today we will be covering the class rhizopoda or amoeba and the uh, parasites of the other classes are explained in the other videos so let's have a start first of all the general features of the class rhizopoda that will be present in the in its organism that is the in it will be present in the antamoeba histolytica so first of all they are very small and microscopic in size second thing is that they don't have any sh shape they don't have any rigid shape so they don't have pellicle or any other rigid structure that give them a rigid shape the next thing is they move with the help of pseudopodia that is very prominent on the basis of this pseudopodia they are uh, mainly classified into the class rhizopoda so that is another feature and they are also called as sarcodina and they, uh, a major portion of them includes the uh, amoeba, so this class is also known as amoeba. So that was all its features, you can see all these features in here that they don't have any definitive shape, this is smaller and microscopic and over here you can see the cytoplasmic extension that is called as pseudopodia or false feet. so that's the general features. Now let's move toward the antamoeba histolytica. So, in the Antamoeba histolytica, first of all is its morphology. Said uh, uh, in its life cycle, it is not present in one form. Like we human beings, we are present in just one form. These little organisms they show different uh, forms in their uh, life cycle. So throughout the life, they changes their body form. So first of all, we will see that there is an insisted form. Insisted form means the cyst of these organisms. So these are the cysts that are excreted by in, uh, infected person and these are then contaminate the food and they are then inject, uh, ingested by the human body. So first of all is their insisted form. The second thing is that insisted form when the cyst is um, uh, broken down or when it is lies as a result the inside trophozyte or the trophozyte is released. So that is its second form and the next thing is that when this trophozyte is again converting into its cystic form so as a, as a result another stage uh, a pre-cystic form or a pre-cystic stage appears. So these are the its three morphological forms in which the entamoeba histolytica may be present in its life cycle. And these forms are important for the diagnostic purpose. You will see that uh, when you are diagnosing um, uh, or when you are examining the stool for diagnostic purposes, so these help in the diagnosis of the uh, infection of the entamoeba histolytica. Now let's see the different forms. First of all, you can see over here its trophozyte form. This is the trophozyte form uh, on the left side. So this is the trophozyte form of the Antamoeba histolytica. So in the trophozyte form, what you will see that there is a uh, on the outside there is a plasma lemma. On the inside you can see a nucleus. Now its nucleus has a beautiful arrangement of the chromatin on the outer border. You can see that the chromatin material are arranged on the outer border or at the periphery, and the nucleolus is present in the center. So this is a typical arrangement of the Antamoeba histolytica nucleus. You can see. It. The next thing is that the uh, cytoplasm is endoplasm or here you can see the inner granular endoplasm and the outer ectoplasm you can see that and there will be present ingested RBCs in the trophozyte form you can see these are the, uh, the, the trophozyte form of any parasite is its feeding form so you will see a lot of food vacuoles and ingested material in the trophozyte form not only of the um, of the histolytica but in any parasite 
you will see that the trophocyte farm is its feeding the farm or it is the farm in which it is feeding so this you can see the food vacuums the ingested rbcs now you can see over here is its pre cystic farm when this trophocyte farm is uh, converting into a cystic farm so as a result what happens that it becomes a bit circular or ovoid in shape you can see that so a bit circular or, or ovoid in shape what happens that there are no rbcs there there are no ingested rbcs or the food vacuoles you can see that over here and the next thing is uh, that the cyst wall is yet not secreted so that's why it is called as pre cystic farm so when the cyst wall will be secreted around it then it will be converted into the cystic farm so now let's see the cystic farm of it so in the cystic farm first of all you look uh, at this picture so this is the its first early cystic farm you can see the cyst wall is secreted around it moreover there is a gly uh, glycogen mass you can see this a uh, vacuum uh, shape sector so this is the glycogen mass and along with that you will see in the early cystic farm that there are chromidal bars so these chromidal bars are actually the rna complex which are stained darkly you can see these are the rna complexes which are stained darkly so these are the chromidal bars a glycogen mass and the nucleus you can see out periphery on the outer periphery the chromatin material is arranged and in the center is the nucleolus so this is the early cystic farm now this early cystic farm then converts into the mature cystic farm over here so this is a mature cystic farm so how does it convert first of all its nucleus divides into two and then that again divides into two and thus as a result four nuclei are formed you can see four nuclei in the mature cystic farm in the early cystic farm only one is present moreover the chromidal bars and the glycogen mass that disappear so you can see that in the mature cystic farm there is or in the mature cyst there is no glycogen mass or there are no chromidal bar so you can see this is the mature cyst that will be then excreted in the feces and it will contaminate uh, the food and then it will cause an uh, infection again so this is all about the morphology we have studied its trophocyte farm its pre cystic farm and now its cystic farm in which we have studied the early cystic farm and the mature cystic farm let's move ahead towards the life cycle of the amoeba histolytica so let's check out now in the life cycle first of all the infected person will release the cystic form of the or the cyst of the entamoeba histolytica you can see this is a mature cyst with the four nuclei so this is excreted in the feces now when these feces uh, contaminate food and when this cyst is injected ingested you can see this cyst is when ingested it now it reaches the large intestine now it is uh, resistant to the acids of the stomach so it uh, passes in the cyst form and reaches the large intestine now when it reaches large intestine then what happens focus over here here is the cystic form that was ingested and it has now reached the large intestine and now what happens that the the alkaline uh, juices of the uh, small intestine it dissolves the cyst wall so as a result what happened that excess excess occur now what uh, the after the excess the metacyclic amoeba that is formed you can see it is a metacyclic amoeba a metacystic amoeba with the four nuclei so this is farm now these nuclei then divide into eight and thus eight amoebae or eight trophozytes are farm now these uh, this is a typical trophozyte you can see it has ectoplasm endoplasm a nucleus and ingested rbcs you will see in this the, the when it in fact the intestine and when it is it causes uh, its feeding so what happens that in the small intestine, in the large intestine, it will cause intestinal ulcers, a classical flask shape ulcer, we will see them shortly in the pathogenicity, and it may cause extra intestinal complication, it may reach to the liver and causes the liver abscess, or it may reach to the mm, uh, lungs and may cause uh, an abscess over there, or it may also cause an abscess in the brain. So that's all, that's all, it's, uh, that's all are its extra intestinal complication. Let's move ahead. So this trophozyte farm. Now this trophocyte form then again it is converted into the pre cystic form and this pre cystic form then again forms a mature cyst. You can see first of all it's two nuclei, uh, one nucleus then divided into two nuclei and those two then again form four nuclei and the chromidal parts and the glycogen mass disappear in the mature cystic form and that mature cyst is then excreted in the feces and when these feces contaminate the food as a result the cycle repeats again. 
so that was all about its life cycle just a brief overview overview meiosis are ingested they reaches the large intestine then excess milk occur the trophozyte is formed that trophozyte then causes the pathogenicity and after that some of the uh, the trophozytes then they are um, uh, converted into the cyst and that cyst is then again uh, excreted in the feces and thus the cycle repeats now let's move ahead to the pathogenicity that what are the various complication what are the various uh, pathogenesis that are caused by the antimicrobial histolytica so first of all is mebs so the mebs is basically mebs include all the uh, complication or uh, all the clinically symptoms that are caused by the all the those clinical conditions that are produced in the human host by the infection of the antimicrobial histolytica so it include all those condition that are produced in the human host by the infection of the antimicrobial histolytica so what are those infections first of all is the intestinal lesion we have seen in its life cycle that what happened that when it reaches the uh, large intestine it then enters through the crypts of leberkens and it destroys the columnar cells of the uh, mucosa and it causes a typical fast shape ulcer you can see over here it enters the crypts of leberkens it Causes the destruction of the columnar cell. It reaches to the submucosa and then it forms this flask shape ulcer. You can see this flask shape ulcer. So this is a typical clinical condition that is caused by antimicrobial histolytica. This flask shape ulcer. And now this, due to this ulcer, you will see that there is bloody diarrhea in uh, MEBS. So this is a, its intestinal lesion. Moreover, extra intestinal lesion may also take place. Here it may be, it may enter into the portal blood, and from there it is taken up by the liver, or it may then cause complication in the lungs and brain too. It causes mainly the abscess formation over there. So it, when it is taken up over here and it reaches the liver by the portal blood, what happens that it may cause the, uh, it uh, divide over there and it forms a mass. Then it causes the thrombosis of the. Uh, hepatic uh, arteries and what happens that uh, due to that the necrosis of the hepatic cells occur fast formation occur and as a result the liver abscess is formed in a similar way the uh, lung abscess may be formed or in the brain an abscess may be formed so that's all about the MABS so uh, it's intestinal lesion and it's extra intestinal lesions now what will be the clinical manifestations first of all in the intestinal MEBS first of all in the acute intestinal MEBS what will happen that there will be dysentery that is there will be bloody diarrhea and uh, along with the mucus so uh, dysentery will be there the lower abdominal pain of course and the flatulence and tenesmus so these are the uh, uh, clinical manifest manifestation of the acute intestinal MEBS the tenesmus mainly means that uh, there is an urge to urinate or defecate but it is a false urge that is no defecation actually take place but you you just have an urge so these are the acute intestinal mebs man uh, clinical manifestation now in the chronic intestinal mebs what will happen that in the chronic state mainly 90% are asymptomatic that the symptoms don't appear the next thing is occasionally diarrhea fever or uh, diarrhea weight loss or fatigue may occur and the next thing in this is that really amoeboma amoeboma is formed now amoeboma which is also known as amoebic granuloma. It is uh, a complication of the antimicrobial histolytica that where annular, uh, annular colonic granulation are formed and this mimic the colon carcinoma. So these look like that there is a colon carcinoma, but it is actually amoeboma. So this uh, these are the complication of the chronic, chronic intestinal MEBS. Now it's extra intestinal let's see the clinical manifestation of extra intestinal MEBS so mainly it is hepatic MEBS what will happen that uh, when the abscess is formed in the liver as we have studied that when by portal vein it reaches up to the liver it causes necrosis and abscess formation so there will be tender and enlarged liver and there will be pain in the right upper quadrant and weight loss and fever so these are the uh, clinical manifestation of the hepatic MEBS so we have gone through all the intestinal and the extra intestinal uh, MEBS uh, and in the intestinal we have seen the clinical manifestation of the acute as well as the chronic uh, MEBS so that's all about its clinical manifestation now how will you diagnose the infection of the antimicrobial histolytica so first of all is for intestinal MEBS when there is a diarrhea is present and all the uh, symptoms of the intestinal MEBS is present you will go for the stool examination now 
in this tool what you will see that there will be trophozyte in acute amoebic dysentery trophozyte now you, we have studied this morphology of the uh, amoeba and amoeba histolytica by its diagnosis so in the trophozyte you will see that there will be ingested rbcs in there and the typical nucleus of the trophozyte we have said that there will be central nucleolus and at the periphery at the border there will be uh, the chromatin material arranged so that is a typical trophozyte shape of the uh, and amoeba histolytica Moreover, you can see cysts in the chronic amoebic dysentery. In case of the chronic amoebic dysentery, you will see the cysts that have the four nuclei. We have studied that each cyst have four nuclei, is mature cysts. So you will see that, and there will be no ingested RBCs in there. So this tool examination for the intestinal amoebiasis, and you will see the trophozyte in acute amoebic dysentery, whereas cysts of the entamoeba histolytica in the chronic amoebic dysentery. Now we will move ahead that for extra intestinal amoebiasis, how will you diagnose that? So for that, we have serological tests, mainly uh, indirect hemagglutination tests is mainly, uh, this test mainly use, uh, give the positive test for the infected people and the, there is a counter electrophoresis test. So these are the serological tests for the extra intestinal amoebiasis. Moreover, intradermal tests can also be used for the uh, extra intestinal amoebiasis. Oh, so what is this intradermal test that first of all they, uh, we have the cultured entamoeba histolytica culture of entamoeba histolytica now from that culture uh, antigen is taken so now that antigen 0.1 ml of that antigen is injected intradermally now if in case of infected person what will happen that in three hours erythema will occur and that erythema will show that the person is infected so these are the diagnostic procedures for the infection of the entamoeba histolytica the final thing is its treatment that how will you treat the mm, treat the infection of the entamoeba histolytica so that treatment is by mti that is a metronidazole tinidazole and idokinol so these three drugs are mainly used for its treatment you can remember this by the mnemonic mti so that was all about the entamoeba histolytica i have described in detail so thank you very much and do subscribe my channel for upcoming videos. Thank you again.